Please be seated. Well, on, the, on behalf of the Skaken family, I'd like to welcome you all here today as we've come together to celebrate and to give thanks for the life of Casey. Uh, just before we begin, uh, if you have a cell phone, I'd just ask that you turn it on to silent. I'd also like to welcome everybody who is joining us here via live stream. Uh, I understand there are people from far and wide signing in, uh, as far away as the United Kingdom and Florida, uh, Montreal, British Columbia, and Grand Prairie. So we are thankful for the technologies that allow us to be able to come together in these creative ways these days. As well, we welcome friends joining us from Canterbury Manor today. It is good to have you with us. The order of service can be found in the service cards. Well, my name's Joanne, and uh, it is a great honor for me to have been asked to be part of celebrating Casey's life today. I met uh, Sandy and Casey about Oh, just over three and a half years ago at Canterbury Manor as I was the uh, chaplain there. And uh, it was very apparent to me the, the love and care the two of them shared together uh, and the dedication of uh, Sandy, especially as Casey moved into Linwood and she was going back and forth every day. Casey passed into his eternal rest on October 16th of this year. We're thankful that uh, in these times, especially that we can gather together and to celebrate and remember Casey, a husband, father, grandfather, uncle, mentor, friend, and other things, I think. We give thanks for the gift of his life and we will commend Casey to God's everlasting care. In gathering together today, we also come to share, to comfort one another in the loss and grief of a much loved family member and friend. So as we begin today, I invite you to join me in a prayer. Loving and gracious God, we come into your presence today to celebrate and give thanks for Casey and to seek your comfort in our sorrow. Give us strength to rejoice that Casey is now with you where there is no more pain or sorrow and where he is now at perfect peace. Lord, you turn the darkness of death into the dawn of new life. Be with us as we hear your promises and give thanks and share memories of Casey. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the reading from scripture that has been chosen for us today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and I'd like to read that for you. Everything has its time. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. The word of the Lord. Every time I read that passage, I'm struck by the fact that over 2,000 years ago, the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes wrote these words that still seem so appropriate for us today. The words describe the fact that God's plan involves a variety of experiences and activities where there is a time for every matter in life. 
The words illustrate, illustrate that fact by juxtaposing those pairs of opposites, examples of how life is comprised of various seasons, uh, and such a variety of seasons enriches our appreciation for the whole envelope of life, if you will. For instance, today is a sad time in that we say goodbye to a beloved and loved and appreciated man. And yet, a happy time nonetheless, as we remember and give thanks to God for all of the many beautiful seasons of Casey's life, for the blessing he was as husband and father, brother, uncle, community leader, and work colleague, among other things. We'll hear of the richness in these presentations uh, coming up. Casey's life was one that knew birth and death, war and peace, loving and caring, work and play, building up and tearing down quite literally, giving and receiving, among other seasons. We thank God for all these times each of you have shared with Casey over his life. And even though we might wish there was more time, we might wish there were more seasons, the loss of Casey means now a new time. For him, great freedom from the challenges of Alzheimer's. And for you, Sandy, Nadine, Dan, and Andrea and your families, perhaps a new balance in life, a new normal. As we accept a new season where Casey lives on in our hearts and memories and knowing that he is now in eternal rest with our Lord. And so for you and for all of you grieving the loss of Casey, my prayer is that you will experience your walk forward knowing the comfort and strength that God offers and that you will turn to God in this season of your lives and experience him refreshing your soul and leading the way to all goodness as you journey, as your journey continues. May God bless you all now and always. Amen. I'd like to invite two of Casey's grandchildren, Evan and Claire Lawrence, to come forward and share memories of their grandfather. And as they do, as they are coming forward, I just wanted to mention um, that Sonia, is Sonia here? No, she's not able to make it, but Sonia um, was the, the illustrator of the front of your programs. So. Hello everyone and thank you for attending both in person and virtually Casey's Gagan Celebration of Life. My name is Claire and this is my brother Evan. Casey was our grandfather who we along with our cousin Sonia referred to as Dido. Today we are honoring, celebrating and remembering Dido and wanted to share a few stories and memories to help us do so. I feel so grateful to have had all four of my grandparents around me for all of my life until this time even though it is so hard to lose one. In my eyes, Dita was a kind-hearted, gentle person with such drive and intelligence who truly inspired me. He struggled with Alzheimer's for most of my adult life, and while I wish I could have gotten to really know him once I was an adult, I am still thankful for the time we had together. Even when he forgot my name, he made me feel loved. One summer, a few years ago, I fell asleep by accident on a couch in the afternoon. I woke up slightly to some banging about on the balcony, and next thing I know, I heard, yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, and awoke to see Dito bent over, waving in my face. I sat up confused, and he said, you, and gestured toward the balcony. He had decided he wanted to sit there in the sun with me, and so we did. Dito also, excuse me, Dito also inspired me. As you'll hear today, he designed and made many things. He made homes, he made buildings, he made things safer and he made countless special memories for his family and friends. He made the cabin at Lake Wobman with the help of many of those family and friends, most especially our Granny Sandy. For me, the lake was a formative place where I connected with nature and Dito's do-it-yourself attitude. He always had projects on the go and was keen to get us involved in them, pointing out the finer details of picking the right Christmas tree from the woods setting up for an afternoon of ice fishing and modifying my guitar so it was easier to play. 
Dito's attention to detail also extended to his punctuality. He was famously early, especially when leaving for the airport. There was a time he and Granny were leaving for vacation abroad, and upon arriving at the airport, he realized that he had forgotten his camera. Since he was always more than two hours early for flights, he still had time to drive back to Wobbeman, retrieve his camera, and make the flight. From speaking to some of our family, I've reflected on the different ways through which Dito expressed himself, and a common theme has been through creating beautiful things with and for those he loved. There was a playhouse that Dito designed and built with his three, gra three children at their Garneau house in Edmonton. Always a dedicated and hard worker, Dito would come home from the office to get all three kids outside hammering away with him until dinner time, after which he would return to the office to finish the day's work. The playhouse was so great that when it came time to move to a bigger house, the playhouse came with, moved by Crane, which years later my brother and I would play in and even camp out in from time to time. And as Evan mentioned, Dito also designed and hand-built the Walman Lake House with help from pretty much everyone he knew. In both Edmonton and at the lake, Dito built pottery studios for Granny, where Granny created beautiful works that the whole family cherish, including seasonal bells, the more intricate of which were often designed by Dito. Many years later, later, Dito decided that he and I would design and build a birdhouse together, which, naturally, also had an intricate design with hand-hammered wooden shakes on the roof. I often think of Dito at my work, energy consulting for the building industry, when I look at architectural drawings and analyze the performance of new designs, especially for the building envelope. It's exciting work as the industry continues to make strides towards ever more efficient and sustainable buildings. I didn't get to discuss my work with Dito in detail, as I only started it a few years ago, but I liked telling him what I was up to and that I was working with, on big buildings across Canada. Even after retirement, he was always keen to look at new and interesting buildings. I recall him making a detour in winter to take a look at the modernist-inspired Jasper Place Library, not too far from Granny and Dito's retirement home, Canterbury. Dito made sure to point out the undulating concrete roof, which he found quite impressive. He's with me every time I see something new and impressive at work and out in the world. To end, we wanted to share a few words that our dad, Tom, who is attending this ceremony virtually, wrote about our Dito. Dad says that Dito was a really special guy who he liked and admired immensely. Dad knows how special he was to Evan and I and how special we were to him, saying that Dito was so thrilled to have us in his life right from when we were just the tiniest of babies when he just smiled and smiled at us. And just as we know we were special, in Dito's eyes, was he ever special in ours? Tito, I hope you rest easy, and I'll miss you always. I'd like to finish by sharing the last of four tasks that the psychologist J. William Worden gives the bereaved to process their grief. He says that after accepting the loss, experiencing the pain, and adjusting to an environment without the deceased, we should look for an enduring connection with them, perhaps by answering the question, what did the person give you? I think we're all here today because Dito gave us something. <sighs> Whether it was connection and mentorship, a taste for mid-century design or martinis, he was a giver and will stay with us always. <sighs> Loss doesn't go away, but neither will my connection to Dito. Thank you. Thank you, Clara and Evan. The next part of our celebration is a video presentation narrated by Casey and Sandy's daughter, Nadine. Uh, the title of this presentation is called The Early Years, Career and Our Dad. And it also includes recordings from Casey's nieces, um, Denise, Nikki, and Kathy. We enjoyed looking back at the photos of the early years. 
My Guido, Casey's dad, had carefully noted dates and names for us to put the pieces back together. It's no wonder that young Casey too loved photography. Starting in the first row on the lower right, Casey, next to his mother Rachel, his niece Nikki, his dad Casian, and sister Zena. Returning left to right, Nick and Maria Tommen, Casey's sister and brother-in-law, and his dear Uncle Alec Skaken. Casey was born in Vegreville, Alberta on September 21, 1933. He is pictured here in the arms of his uncle Alec and with his sister Maria. As Guido notes, this is one-year-old Casey with his pets. And here, his sister Maria has Casey and his pets in tow. On the wooden sidewalks in Willingdon, in front of the Skakens grocery store. We don't know much about his violin playing years, although we still had the three-quarter sized instrument when he raised his own kids. Wearing his forever favorites, the bow tie and suspenders. Rachel and Casian moved with their three children to Edmonton, Alberta. They are pictured here with the young Tom and family on the front porch of their 103rd Street house. It was a home inspired by the pioneering spirit of his parents and enriched by their Ukrainian heritage. After high school, Casey headed out to study architecture at UBC in Vancouver. He'd returned to Edmonton for the summer. It was one of these summers when he met the girl next door. Well, actually, she lived across the street. Casey returned from UBC for the third summer and carefully planned the occasion when he would propose to Sandy. He organized a picnic at precisely 5 to 5 on the fifth day of the fifth month of May in 1955, Casey asked her for her hand in marriage. They were married June 9th of the following year. His uncle Alec was best man and Sandy's sister Nettie Wright was matron of honor. Niece Nikki Tommen was a junior bridesmaid and niece Connie Smolak was their flower girl. They celebrated with over 600 guests the Ukrainian hospitality of Casey's renowned catering mother and enriched with traditions, family and friends. Here we have a glimpse of the celebration the day after the wedding, still feasting. Sandy and Casey said farewell to their families on 103rd Street and set out on their honeymoon. And in the fall, they departed for Vancouver together for Casey's final year in architecture school. Their first home was a basement suite in Vancouver, where even in a makeshift kitchen, Sandy managed to always welcome Casey home with her baking. He enjoyed his years on the West Coast, but his heart never left Alberta. That was his shkatulka in his right hand, and although he had a replacement in later years, he still referred to his book bag as his shkatulka. It was reliably stocked with sorted pens and pencils and a full set of colored felt pens. Casey was highly respected during his architectural career. He registered with the Alberta Association of Architects in 1958 and was honored by the profession in 1997 and 2005. And in 2014, the association recognized him as a life member. In 1997, he was elected fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada.
Casey's services and contributions were recognized in many circles, including Construction Specifications Canada, Alberta Building Standards Council, the City of Edmonton, the National Research Council, and he received an Alberta Achievement Award in Architecture. He was always honored, but forever humble. He kept all the mementos tucked away in a portfolio for us to discover upon his passing. Casey embarked on his career in an architectural partnership with his UBC classmate, Joe Nato. They were later joined by Don Sinclair. These were the days of drafting boards, pencils, and erasers. This set of construction drawings for the fine arts building at the U of A included 170 drawings. They were produced by the architects, structural, electrical, and mechanical engineers. There were no computers doing clash detection. The process of coordinating the drawings, that is, making sure that they didn't contradict each other, happened visually by flipping through the plans and sections to confirm their accuracy. For this building, the drawings were accompanied by two plastic coil-bound three-inch books of specifications. Dad was the detail guy. He really cared about getting it right. So specification writing is a really important part of compiling construction documents. Looking to build his skills in this practice, Casey joined the Spec Writers Association of Canada in 1962 and shortly thereafter became a founding member of the Edmonton chapter of the organization known today as CSC, Construction Specifications Canada. This was the beginning of his long-term involvement and commitment to an organization which grew to be more than just for specification writers. He was inducted into the CSC College of Fellows in 1981 and received the CSC Life Membership Award in 2003. On that occasion, Casey reflected on the CSC. As an association whose membership was comprised of the design and construction industry in its broadest sense, it provided an excellent forum for learning, not only from other specification writers, but also from contractors, subtrades, architects, engineers, suppliers, manufacturers, insurers, and more. And, he noted, it certainly did not hurt business. When you think about it, the growth and stature of CSC has been mainly as a result of the work of many, many volunteers. Truly amazing, and it continues to strengthen and grow. In a recent tribute, CSC wrote that Casey gave of himself freely and mentored a countless number of CSC and other industry members for which the industry did and continues to benefit from. Casey worked long hours, but he also spent quality time with his young family in those years, making time for trips to the Canadian Rockies that he loved. In 1974, Casey joined Jim Wensley as an associate and ultimately in a partnership that evolved over the years to include Jim, Casey Skaken, John Webster, Gary Fry, and Len Rodriguez. Business partners, yes, but the Wensley years defined lifelong friendships. When Dad joined Jim's practice, buildings were still built from hand-drawn construction drawings. This is the cover page for the Manulife Place project built in Edmonton. Sometimes he'd take Nadine into the office on weekends. She might get to repair torn drawing paper sets, but eventually he taught her how to read drawings, make sure that none of the toilet partition doors were missing because if they weren't drawn, it would cost extra money. She felt very important. I trust you see me smiling now. Well, full circle in Nadine's career as she encountered the superintendents that Dad had worked with. They noted how they loved his projects because the drawings were so well coordinated. But on the other hand, there were no change orders. Early in his Wensley years, Casey was tasked with the challenge of researching and investing in the new fad, AutoCAD, and the industry moved from pencils and drafting boards into the era of computer-assisted design. Dan remembers taking the trip to Texas with Dad to meet with the software company to make that first investment. Perhaps it was writing those specifications that triggered Casey's focus on building envelopes. Quick definition, the building envelope keeps the elements, 
cold, heat, wind, rain out and a comfortable environment in our buildings. So we're talking about the roof, the windows, the walls. On this construction photo of the Manulife building, you can see the building envelope, the exterior wall construction, has started on the lower floors. Casey pioneered and mentored the practice of building envelope in Canada and contributed immensely to the building industry practices and standards. It was an industry that he loved and where he fostered lifelong friendships. Manulife years were the pioneering years for the science of building envelope design and Casey was integral to the industry that was defining the science, especially for building in our cold northern climates. The Wensley years were enriched with friendships, both within the company and beyond. Casey and Sandy built amazing connections and great friends across the construction industry. The 70s were incredibly intense and busy years. The Wensley team worked really hard, but they played hard too. It was pretty cool in these artistic circles, commemorating, laughing, and celebrating together. The early 80s were very hard on Alberta, and these were exceptionally challenging years for the construction industry overall. But once the Wensley team survived the downturn, Casey moved on to his third career. From 1985 through 1999, Casey built and led the infrastructure team with Alberta Public Works Supply and Services. Had to share the full image because Stan and Dan are really tall guys. If anything defines Casey's years here, it was the competence, integrity, and passion of the team that formed around the practice of building science that Casey loved. Although everything about his role was about team building and defining the quality and standards for public properties, a couple of notable projects include the fall of the general. Casey provided oversight to the dramatic demolition of the General Hospital in Calgary. Truth be known, I think this one was hard on Dad. He was a builder. Albeit stressful, it was a notable highlight. And the caption says, here's to a mighty fine job, by the way. The general is three blocks over. Note the martinis in everyone's hands. He proudly contributed to the building envelope preservation of the Alberta legislature in Edmonton. And he even shared a job site tour of the upper dome structure with his daughter Nadine. Devoted to his daughters in their years of dance, and after serving as president, Casey was named an honorary lifetime member of the Ukrainian Cherimosh Society. In the final years of his career, Casey joined Reed Jones Christofferson, where he was thrilled to mentor in a practice he loved. Although we teased the architect for joining the engineers, he enjoyed these years immensely. Casey was very close to his parents and siblings and made sure that they were a big part of the world his kids grew up in. We were very lucky to have known the generation that had such an influence on who our dad was. Gentle, genuine, caring, and with an extraordinary work ethic. Casey and, Casey and Daniel Casey Skagen. Dad's sisters and parents were a big part of our lives and a big influence on the succession of Ukrainian traditions. Casey's mom and his sisters were very dear to him. Even though Maria and Nick moved to the West Coast in their retirement years, Casey and Maria remained very close. They were soulmates. Zena lived in Edmonton, so the two probably connected at least once a week. They had fun together. They always held hands, and in their final years, it was joyful for Zena to have her brother join her as a resident of Linwood Capital Care. In my dear friend Diana's words, there's no easy way to lose a parent, especially when we've struck gold in the parent jackpot. Dad could do anything. He built us games, 
This one was Roll the Ball in the Yawning Yak. And we made him cakes. That cake says, love is for daddies. And we really did love him. And even as we headed out on our own, Sandy and Casey routinely traveled out to visit the kids. Dan studying music in Montreal. And in New York for his final master's music recital. They visit Andrea and their first grandchild, Evan, in St. Andrews, Scotland. And they often made it out to Victoria for wonderful West Coast visits. Casey and Sandy took a few adventurous treks to the Maritimes with Nadine and John. And with his son-in-law John as the official director of travel itinerary, Casey celebrated his 80th birthday in Dildo, Newfoundland. Many of us were fortunate to have enjoyed a martini in Casey's company. He was devoted to the details of preparing his martinis. The secret is very, very dry. And of course, shaken, not stirred, with ice shards, not cubes. Windows on the World in the World Trade Center, 106 stories above Manhattan in 1999. On the deck, out at the lake. Cozied up in the cabin. And anyone dropping by was a great reason to share a martini. Here we are, it's... Sunday and we are here to do a toast to Uncle Casey. Uh, of course we've all got our favorite martinis and our olives and uh, Nikki was just telling me that uh, it was Uncle Casey that got your mom into martinis. And, he uh, did. We used to make, uh, Marianne used to make martinis when Maria, which is Uncle Casey or our Uncle Casey, their Uncle Casey's sister, sister and when she was in extended care. So there you go. It, the, the, it just continued on and here we are. So a uh, cheers with a martini to Casey. Cheers to Uncle, Uncle Casey. Uncle Casey. Cheers. cheers. The best uncle in the world. Yes. So I have a couple of things about Uncle Casey that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is that when I graduated from Nate in 1978, it was in uh, business administration and sales. One of the first jobs I had after I graduated was in direct sales. My boss had told me at the time that I was going to have to take clients out, you know, the old wine and dine back in the late 70s, early 80s. I was petrified. So I phoned Uncle Casey and I asked him if he would be my client and let me practice a wine and dine. And he, I could hear him smiling through the phone and he said yes. So we met on a work day for lunch and he just let me take the reins and run with it. And he made me feel so comfortable, so confident, so like I could conquer the world and it was it was wonderful um i did go out after that and i did do the wine and dine but honestly without having him to practice that first time around i don't think i would have been able to do it thank you uncle casey for helping me work my way into the sales world 
We had many telephone conversations after that. And something that I am forever grateful for that Uncle Casey said to me was, when someone makes a decision, that decision never needed an explanation. So that I have carried with me and it is always, always in my mind because it is so true. Nobody owes an explanation for a decision they have made because it's their decision. So again, Uncle Casey, thank you for so much. Hi, this is a memory sharing time and it's take two because I wasn't being recorded last time. <laughs> Uncle Casey was 10 years older than I. So I often, as I was young, thought of him more as a big brother than my uncle. And I was really afraid sometimes. And one of the times was during the Zoot Zooter days, which was in the 50s. Now they were a bad game and they had a particular look and one of them was Zoot Zooter pants. Uncle Casey had Zoot Zooter pants on when he came. And let me tell you, I was one scared girl. I was hanging on to his pants and crying and telling him to take them off and change them because they were Zoot Zooter pants and they would get him. Well, I don't know what happened, but he was still with us and I was a very happy camper. He knew I loved reading and he brought over a bunch of paperback Mickey Splane books for me. Now I mustn't have been, I couldn't even hardly have been nine years old. And he said he had found them hidden in his house. And after I read them, and they're pretty racy, I hid them in our house. He was just super, he was uh, an actor in high school. And I can remember him sitting on a park bench and there was a pretty girl next to him. And it looked like he was going to kiss her. Well, I, inside, I was just like, don't kiss her, don't kiss her. I just didn't think this was quite right. But he was a very good actor. He also played a musical instrument, some kind of a horn. I forgot about that. And he loved jazz. We used to go to plays that Gita was in, and he always made sure we went. He loved my mother, Maria Tomlin. That was his sister and he adored her. One year for Christmas, they were both quite young, and there was 11 years between them, he bought her this paperweight. This paperweight inside has old Christmas candy. Now take a look at this beauty. I tell you, I, Mom kept it and loved it, and I keep it and I love it. It is beautiful. That to me just shows how much love there was for him to save up his dollars. Now one of the really nice things was he introduced me to sushi and hot sake in a box. Um, that was really a good thing because I love them both to this day. We used to go to one-on-one -on -one lunches as, we were, as I was older. And those were really healing and helpful. One thing about my Uncle Casey that almost put us apart, Pierre Trudeau. He was on this gigantic, huge picture that Uncle Casey hung on the wall behind the Chesterfield. Can you imagine that? Yuck! I ate in the kitchen and that picture stayed up for a while. Anyway, that's one memory that we kind of laugh about. One thing that I, <clears throat> excuse me, that I also remember is Euler Games. They had 
tickets, and so did we. And we used to see each other in the binoculars, stand up, wave, just have fun. Sometimes we even met up for a little coffee in between periods. This was Peter's love for Uncle Casey, the fact that he could talk about the Oilers too. And I remember visiting Uncle Casey near the end of his wonderful life. He didn't recognize anyone, but he saw Peter come in and he looked at him quizzically. And then he yelled, Potts! And that was Peter's nickname. That was really, really a good thing that happened to my husband, because he loved Casey. Casey also had to be one of the nicest men, as we all say, that ever lived. He was quiet, calm, and he just made you feel at ease, and he helped you in whatever you needed help with. I'm gonna miss you, Uncle Casey. I love you. And I will love you. Bye. Hello, friends and family of my Uncle Casey. My name is Kathy, and I am first cousin to Nadine, Andrea, and Dan Skaken. I wish I could be there with all of you today to celebrate um, the amazing life of this wonderful this wonderful person, Uncle, my Uncle Casey. Unfortunately, I'm stuck here in Grand Prairie for a few more days before Christmas. Uh, but in my heart, I am there with all of you today. One of my very earliest childhood memories involved Uncle Casey, and it was during a sleigh ride. I believe it was my mom's 40th birthday, cold day in January, out on a sleigh ride, and Uncle Casey fell off the sleigh and was running after it. And I was, my mom was cuddled up with me and I was watching him behind the sleigh. And it's entirely possible that this memory stems from the photographs we have of it. But in my mind, when I think of this, I can see him running and laughing behind the sleigh, which makes me think that it's an actual memory, not just one stemming from the photographs that I've seen. He was laughing and running and he had his, you know, heavy rimmed dark glasses. I mean, this was in the late 60s. Um, but when I think of my earliest, earliest childhood memory, Uncle Casey is the star of that. So that is something that stays in my heart forever. When I was in junior high school, I had an opportunity to go to France with my grade nine class. And my parents put the stipulation that I would have to pay for half of my trip. So being 12 years old in grade seven, not a lot of places I could find a job, but I approached Uncle Casey, who at the time was at Wensley and Associates down the street from our house. And he put me to work uh, in the copy room. So I was there full time in the summer between grade seven and grade eight, then again in the summer between grade eight and grade nine. And I would work alongside um, some of the people there and I would duplicate blueprints on these giant photocopy machines. Uh, I would work on collating um, brochures and proposals and uh, sometimes there was work to be done on models of buildings and it was very interesting and it taught me at a young age about being in an office and having to be accountable and reliable and present with other people and those types of skills really benefited me when I was a young adult going into office environments and working with other people and I never looked down on the little jobs of filing and photocopying I mean those are the jobs that got me to Paris when I was 15 and thanks to Uncle Casey I was I don't remember how much he paid me um, but I made enough money to pay for my half of my trip and I will always be grateful for that and for that experience because I, I relied on it going forward in my life. Uh, fast forward a few more years, I asked Uncle Casey to give the toast to the bride at my wedding. Uh, we grew up very close to the Skakens and um, 
he seemed the most natural person to ask for this huge favor. Uh, he referred to my organizational skills that I developed when I was working for him and how I still was utilizing them and so organized for my wedding. And I was surprised that he paid attention to those kind of details in my life. But when you think about it, Uncle Casey was a very detailed oriented person in his professional life and personally. And I think too, when he um, designed the cabin at Wabaman Lake and that kitchen, I was amazed that he used every inch of space possible uh, for storage, for spices, for pullouts. And I mean, it was a small kitchen and he utilized every inch as well as he possibly could. There was no wasted space. And I've actually referred to that kitchen to some of my cabinet makers today um, with my design clients when I'm designing their kitchen. I don't wanna leave wasted space. I wanna utilize every inch. And that's another thing that stayed with me that Uncle Casey demonstrated and it's been really valuable in my life he's influenced my life in a lot of ways when my dad passed it'll be 30 years in january um, we really appreciated the support and friendship from uncle casey and auntie sandy they ended up being neighbors with my mom at canterbury court and i live five hours away my brother graham lives further much further away and it always gave us a sense of um, comfort knowing that she had Uncle Casey and Auntie Sandy just upstairs for support and for friendship and uh, that really that really meant a lot to us. Um, I'm sad that it, it took me until now to reflect on a lot of these things. I wish I had thought of them sooner and had maybe been able to express that gratitude to Uncle Casey, not only when he was alive, but before his Alzheimer's took over. Um, and it's always a, an important lesson when people pass away that our, our time is limited and we can't not express our gratitude and our appreciation and our love for people. It's always an important lesson for me when somebody passes away. And it should be for all of us like oh don't leave things unsaid and if you're grateful for somebody let them know because you just don't know how long you have to let them know that i'm sending all my love uh big hugs to all of you today uh, during the celebration of life for uncle casey and i just wanted to share my experiences with him in my life and how influential he was and let you know how much i will miss him greatly take care Casey's niece, Connie, is here with us today, and so she's traveled from uh, Gibbons, BC, so I'd like to invite her to come forward and share her memories with us in person. Good morning. My name is Connie Johnston, and I am so honored to be here today to celebrate the life of Casey. I was also a recipient of those great martinis. I thought I better had that right now while I thought of it, because everybody keeps talking about the martinis. He taught me how to make a mean one. I grew up right across the street from Casey and his parents. And I also lived right next door to my Aunt Sandy, who happens to be the youngest sister of my mother, Lucy Smollick. Through the somewhat oblivious eyes of a small child, I witnessed the courtship of Sandy and Casey. Now, you already heard the story about his proposal with all the five, so I'm not going to repeat that story. But I will say, lucky me, when I was five years old, I was asked to be the flower girl at their wedding. Wow. Those two seemed so old to me. Sandy was 19 and Casey was 22. <laughs> Uncle Casey was always such a humble and unassuming person. I honestly have to say that I learned more about his personal accomplishments and achievements after reading his obituary. You see, Uncle Casey was never one to blow his own horn. It is said that wherever a beautiful soul has been, there is a trail of beautiful memories. 
What I wish to share with you all today are some of the personal reflections and recollections of not only myself, but of other members of Sandy's side of the family, the Costinet clan. For so, for so many of us, Uncle Casey was a living example of what a loyal and loving husband and father should be. We saw not only a good provider, but more importantly, an unconditionally loving, open-minded, and extremely loyal protector to both his wife and his children. Casey truly led by his example and was a role model for all of us. My cousin Karen summed it up beautifully by stating that Sandy and Casey took the entire family on a fairy tale ride, sharing with us the love they showed for each other and providing us with a living example of a good, loving, and solid marriage. Casey was held in such high esteem that in the early years of my marriage, my husband and I asked Casey's permission to name our yet unborn first child after him should the child be a boy. When Casey said yes, my husband replied, good, we will name our baby Skaken Johnston. <laughs> Casey, Casey thought that was pretty funny. Well, we ended up having a one and only daughter, but in uh, a couple of years later, my cousin Diane gave her third daughter, Krista, the initials KC, so he was indeed left with the namesake on the Costanek side of the family. From numerous family members, I have heard a recurrent and common theme, that it was Uncle Casey's quiet, soft-spoken, and gentle manner that they remember. Sandra, a great niece, recalls how he would lean in and almost whisper a joke in her ear. As she was laughing, he would stand with his hands in his pockets looking straight ahead, straight-faced, and appearing completely innocent of being the person who made her laugh. My daughter, Megan, recalled visits to the Skaken home at Wabaman, where Casey might ever so gently tap her on the shoulder and point to whatever wildlife happened to appear, a rabbit, a squirrel, a chickadee. Our Uncle Casey loved and appreciated all nature. My cousin David recalls a time when he and my brother Jerry helped Casey with the building of their Wabaman home. The young men were there putting plastic and tar sealer on the exterior of the wooden basement foundation. Sandy tells me they were in a deep trench doing this and it was really hard and dirty work. But Casey obviously made it a memorable and fun time. David also recalled how much Casey loved to party as the family celebrated many a New Year's Eve at the Wrights' home. Nettie Wright was Sandy's older sister, and she was also living at Canterbury when Sandy and Casey moved in. If they were serving liver and onions for dinner, Nettie would call them to make sure that they all went down for that meal because liver and onions was Casey's absolute favorite. The ladies did it just for Casey as they hated it and always ordered the alternative meal on the menu. <laughs> Another memory shared by my daughter Megan was that Uncle Casey was often wearing a Tilly hat. Today, I don't know if his hat is on display. Is his hat on display anywhere? We were hoping that we would have one of his Tilly hats on display. But um, Sandy told me that Casey's first Tilly was so well-worn and loved, it got a hole in it. Now these particular hats have a lifetime guarantee. So Casey sent the torn hat back to the factory and Tilly sent him a brand new replacement. But they also returned the old hat. So he then had two Tillys in his possession as the torn one was never thrown out. When Casey was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, he handled it with such grace. When he began to struggle to find even commonly used words, if you helped him find the lost word, he seemed ever so grateful. Sandy and Casey loved to dance. Sandy claims that Casey was the one who taught her how. In later years, when they moved to Canterbury, whenever a band was performing, they were often seen on the dance floor. Sadly, as the Alzheimer's progressed, Casey would decline Sandy's invitation to dance, encouraging her to get up and dance without him, but he would always be watching her. The night before he was moved to extended care was February 14th, Valentine's Day. That night, Canterbury had a band. 
and much to Sandy's surprise, as Casey had not danced with her in well over a year, he held out his hand to her and started to stand. Sandy had to support him as he was very unsteady, but he joined her on the dance floor for what would be their last time dancing. Interestingly, he was totally unaware that the very next day he would be moved to a facility that could handle his ever-increasing needs. The day after Casey was settled into the extended care unit, Sandy came to visit him, as she would come to do just about every single day. As she was about to enter the locked unit through the small glass window in the door, she saw Casey sitting on the other side in his wheelchair. He had some of his clothing and his cane piled up on his lap, and lo and behold, on top of his head were both of his Tilly hats. Sadly, he was hoping to go home, but not without his cherished Tillys. Casey loved his photography, and he has left the family with a wonderful legacy of photos. In these, he has left us all with many special moments captured in time. I would like to read you the short poem entitled Time Machine, written by Kelly Polly. I came across a picture of you and I today. The tears just started falling, but I could not turn away. I closed my eyes, and I was there that day so long ago. I saw your eyes still shining bright, alive, and so aglow. I swear I heard your laughter as I gazed upon your face, that golden and contagious sound that nothing can replace. It brought back such sweet memories of how life used to be. Each picture is now a time machine that brings you back to me. In Casey's passing, a limb has fallen from our family tree. Your minds will still talk to him and look for him. Although I hope your souls know that he is finally at peace, but he will be greatly missed. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, that was beautiful. Dan Skaken is Casey and Sandy's son, and so we'll enjoy hearing his remembrances now. This was supposed to happen at the end. Usually I've got one sentence left. Thanks. I was very fortunate as a young child to have had two wonderful loving parents. As I grew older, I started to become aware of and appreciate that fact. In the case of my dad, I heard all sorts of stories from friends, family, <clears throat> and his coworkers about what a talented, hardworking, compassionate, and loyal man he was. Eventually, I began to realize that I wasn't just seeing my own dad through my own rose-colored glasses. He was special to a lot of other people as well. Mm -hmm. 
This will do it. <clears throat> Dad made things work. In our home, he would fix things that needed fixing, whether that was building a wall, making the plumbing work, solving an electrical problem, or finding creative ways to make his space more enjoyable to live in. At the office, he was known for his ability to make things work structurally, especially keeping the heat in and the rain out. But he also made things work in other ways there. In the early 80s, the construction industry was experiencing a downturn. The firm in which Dad was a partner had to reduce considerably their staff over time. Dad was often the man telling an employee they were being let go. It was a tough job, but with the combination of his compassion and the respect accorded to him, he made it work. My personal story about dad making things work is about fishing. We kids used to have fun going fishing with her dad out at Lake Wobbeman. As I grew older, it was time to be responsible for the fish I caught. If you catch them, you got to clean them. Well, I was squeamish about getting gutting and cleaning fish, but I didn't want to pass on the responsibility to someone else. As a result, I stopped going fishing with my dad, and I came to realize that fishing with my dad wasn't really about catching fish. It was about being out on the lake with my dad, and this was important something too important to not do. So we figured out a way to make it work. I enjoyed rowing the boat. So I rowed, Dad did the fishing, and we enjoyed many fun times together out on the lake. Thank you, Dan. The second part of the video presentation will now be played. It includes memories from many friends and family members and a performance of Lullaby of Birdland, and you'll recognize Dan again there uh, on drums. Uh, the video is narrated by Nadine and John Harder. I will never take for granted how powerful an influence the communities we are surrounded by have on our paths through life. Sandy and Casey's first Edmonton home was in Strathern. They moved with their two young daughters to the bungalow on 85th Avenue in Garneau in the early 60s, and Dan was born soon after. The house was precisely half a block from the Noble Building where Sinclair, Skag and Nato had their office. This was convenient because dad worked very long hours. Here you see the architecturally updated front porch and inside lifelong family friend and extraordinary cabinet maker Abe Riegenbach built the first kitchen that Casey designed for Sandy. Of course, Casey's eye for design reached beyond architecture. Note that spelt Buick Wildcat parked out front. Sandy and Casey lucked out on 85th Avenue. It was a friendly, family-focused street. Upon Dad's passing, Lorna Bowker, one of the delightful babysitting age kids on 85th Avenue, wrote a beautiful note to Mum. I have many images of Casey, him bounding up the steps to your home after a day at work, his warm smile, his skill as a listener, his pride in his Ukrainian heritage, his peanuts themed party for Kathy, his support for you and your pottery. I remember the yellow and white sundress he gave you for your anniversary when you were pregnant with Dan. A 
Above all, I remember the love and respect you showed for each other. Casey's sun rose and set on you. You made each other shine. You were his and he was yours. And even when Alzheimer's robbed him of many things, you still found ways for him to feel valuable and loved. You continued to see his essence. Yes, having each other made more of both of you. Mom and Dad found a way to set Andrea and I up with piano lessons with Joyce Moore. Joyce and her daughters lived in the clinker brick house across the street from us. I remember so clearly how Dad would explain to me on Saturday mornings that one day I would thank him for making me practice. About 30 years ago, I made it an annual habit to thank Dad. Music is one of my greatest joys in life. So one more time, Dad, thanks for making me practice. Today, nearly 60 years later, you can still find the Garneau houses on the tree-lined 85th Avenue. Sandy and Casey lived in the first house on the left with dear friends the Satch family next door and the Bowker family next to them. The house used to be yellow. And the Moore family clinkerbrick home across the street. In the mid-60s, with threats of the street be being rezoned for apartments, Casey gathered the neighbors together and they successfully preserved the single family zoning. Never doubt that a small group can make a difference. Well, Sandy got a dream kitchen and the kids got a custom playhouse. As mom tells us, dad actually had the kids helping him out on the project, running and delivering from the stockpile of cedar shingles to keep his evening construction hours productive. We loved the playhouse, so the decision to move didn't go over too well with the kids. So soft-hearted Casey arranged for the playhouse to move with us. Using a small mobile crane to pick it up out of the backyard to a flatbed trailer and move it to the new neighborhood. Why not, eh? Well, Dad didn't have to build a playhouse in Belgravia. The kids and their neighborhood friends had many years of fun in that playhouse. Actually, it entertained two generations. Don't let that picture fool you. Dad didn't take much time off. Casey didn't have to build a new playhouse, but there were a few projects at 7406 119th Street. There were a lot of renovations, and yes, in the upper right corner, Casey designed and A built Sandy another beautiful kitchen. He jackhammered out the concrete floor in the garage to build a root cellar. But the big project at the Belgravia house was Sandy's pottery studio. Dennis Wozni, Casey's seriously great friend, tells the story of how Dad needed a little help. Sandy is a potter and Casey was a builder, so when it came to building his studio, Casey was all over it. Sandy had this kiln that was as big as a train locomotive that was built out of bricks. Sandy's kiln was located in the middle of her studio and was vented through the roof. The chimney wasn't completed when I got the call from Casey to come give him a hand. When I arrived, he showed me his new soapstone carvings and tried to distract me from the big task that was coming. After giving me a tour of Sandy's studio, he took me out in the snow to show me the insulated stainless steel chimney section that had to go up on the roof. If you can imagine, it's about four feet long, one foot in diameter, and easily weighs a thousand pounds. I asked him if he had a crane coming or what the heck. He then told me his plan. We would put up his pathetic Ukrainian aluminum ladder, then roll a section up the ladder to the roof, 
I looked at him like, how do you plan on lifting that on the ladder, not to mention rolling it up to the roof? He looked at me with, not me, but you. <laughs> You're kidding, right? Well, do you have a better plan, Casey asked. I looked at him and said, yeah, a crane. Not to argue with the master, we managed to get the ladder up and move the section to the bottom. We both agreed that dead lifting the chimney was not the answer. Wait, he says. I'm thinking he'll finally agree to hire a crane. No, he goes on to describe the process. We'll tie the rope to the top of the ladder, down and around the section, and then pull, roll it up, double leverage, easy peasy. I start up the ladder. Wait, Casey says. I'll pull, and you can push and control the roll. Before you can say Kubasa, he's at the top of the ladder, hanging onto a 5 16th inch rope. This is not going to go well, I think. We're headed for disaster. It's 20 below out, and I'm starting to sweat with fear. I maneuver the section up the ladder about three feet, and I'm hanging on for dear life, yelling at him to pull on the rope. The rope wasn't centered, so the section falls off into the snow. Again, I lift it back onto the ladder, center the rope, and yell at Tarzan to pull. Casey, at best, is not Tarzan, not even a reasonable facsimile. I'm thinking I have a wife, four children, and I'm going to be crushed by a chimney. Eventually, we get the section to the roof, and my knees are weak and shaking from fear. I look over at Smiley, and he gives me that, what? No big deal. See? I could have been a flat, wise knee lying at the bottom of a ladder. <laughs> Suffice to say, after that, I always ask him what his plans were before we got together. I miss the guy. In the background here, the studio is built. Now Casey has time to move on to new assembly priorities. The wagon for Claire and Evan. Wallowland Lake was special to the Skaken and Kostyanuk families. Long before Sandy and Casey bought their property, they enjoyed great times with Sandy's sister Nettie and the Wright family, and with Casey's sister Maria and the Tommen family. Casey, the young architect, designed the cabin for his sister Maria, husband Nick Tommen, and their children. This would be the first of many of his building projects at Lake Wabaman. You can see him here working with his dad, who shared his skills as a builder with his son. The tools, the builder's smarts, the caring and attention to detail, the workmanship, and the I can do it attitude that Casey in turn instilled in his own children and grandchildren. Side note, this may also have been Nadine's first job site visit. <laughs> Auntie Sandy, Nadine, John, Andrea, Evan, Claire, Dan, Elizabeth, and Sonia. Raymond and I uh, send our love and healing as we all grieve the passing of Uncle Casey. He was such a caring and loving man and a favorite uncle. For those who don't know, my mom, Maria Tommen, was Uncle Casey's sister. One of the greatest gifts that Uncle Casey gave our family was agreeing to help my dad, Nick Tommen, with the design and build of our cabin at the lake. A cabin as what we called it, but most people called it a house. Um, and they would laugh when we would call it a cabin. The cabin was far ahead of its time in architectural design, as you can see by the picture I have here. The slanted roof attracted many people as they drove by and they were like so not used to this type of a design, but it was very attractive to everybody. On Fridays, we would pack and wait for dad to come home and then we would head off to the lake as soon as he got home. It was a place we would have family and friends. I learned how to water ski there, drive the boat, ice 
ice fish with my gido as well as fish in the summer. I also learned how to um, dirt, bike, dirt bike ride. Uncle Casey's contribution to making our cabin come to fruition gave us the gift of childhood and teenage memories as well as adult memories, and we thank you for that. Uncle Casey was a man who loved family. He always celebrated um, many family events together with our family, our childhood birthdays, Christmas, Easter. It has been so wonderful to know my cousins and grow up with them. I will always remember his amazing smile along with the glint in his eyes and that funny little chuckle he had. Oh, and I can't forget his soft-spoken voice. I would always have to ask him to speak up when we were talking on the telephone and tell him that I was the one that was hard of hearing. We're going to miss you, Uncle Casey, but we know you are whole again and in the wonderful company of those who have gone before you. I love you. We love you. And I'd just like to say on a lighter note, uh, you'll see a number of pictures that came from Mary Ann, and a lot of them uh, had Uncle Casey with a lot of martinis in the frames. And I'm going, wow, I just, I remember that, that he was the one that introduced me to vodka martinis, but they were actually scotch martinis. So, just to let you know that we're reviving that, uh, we're re reviving that martini cocktail. Today? Uh, today, as a matter of fact, uh, we're going to have a little toast and uh, the martini with scotch will continue. Yes. That's it. We love you. We love you. Bye. The original one bedroom cabin and accompanying guest houses served the family well over the years that Casey undertook the building uh, er, and demolition to achieve his vision. Fishing was a priority. He often took the old rowboat out with his sister Zena, loved a chance to take out the grandkids, and on occasion shared a few secrets with his son-in-law. So after the double-seater outhouse, I believe the boathouse was the first project, deluxe accommodation for the rowboat. The next project, the garden shed. It was really quite a work of art. Clearly, it was time to embark on the cabin itself. It was carefully crafted, and now that we all know the vocabulary, it had an amazing building envelope. Note the makeshift rain gutters on the right side of this picture. And finally, the garage, and yes, another pottery studio for Sandy. Many great years followed. The kids loved the place. And so did the grandkids. Casey built rope swings in the trees and waved to the train engineers. He worked with each of them to build their own birdhouses. The gardens were fabulous. Casey and Sandy liked to cycle into town and enjoyed breakfasts with the locals at the Wabaman Hotel. I think that the last construction project was the gazebo. It was built above the root cellar constructed into the hill behind the cabin many years earlier. Dad was notorious for salvaging and reusing building materials. True to form, the gazebo included screen walls from Sandy's brother Bob and sister-in-law Bess. Casey's son Dan shares this story. Once upon a time, my mom and dad gave me a bag of rocks. Not a nasty big bag of rocks like Charlie Brown ended up on Halloween but a wonderful bag of flat skipping rocks. They came with a photo of a calm Lake Wabama. And a note saying, Dan, the magic of the place beckons. I don't remember all the details, but I'm sure I took my parents up on their kind offer 
and visited them at the lake. No doubt I was well fed and enjoyed some excellent company. Had some quiet time by the lake and of course, skip rocks. I still have a lot of those skipping rocks, including one in my pocket right now. Rock skipping is something I learned from my dad, who was very good at it. When I'm out in the world and my path crosses a body of water, rest assured I'll be looking for some flat rocks. I've enjoyed passing on the Skaken rock skipping tradition to daughter Sonia, and she has become a good skipper herself. Oh, how Casey loved his grandkids. Andrea's children, Evan and Claire, were born in the early 90s. And although they lived very far away and all over the world, the Dido tie never broke. Here's young Evan helping Dito get some work done. Nice one, Claire. Not too many occasions that Dad gave up his Tilly hat. Dan and Elizabeth's daughter, Sonia, was born in 2008. Dito was elated to have a grandchild in Edmonton and enjoyed these precious years. Casey, like his father, had a soft spot for critters. He loved the sparrows and the chickadees and was a good pal with Nadine's lovebird, Max. In Garno, the Satch family had Putty, a Siamese cat that found a special spot in Dad's heart. In Belgravia, the Tompkins family had Tammy and Tigger, two Himalayan cats that befriended our family in the new neighborhood. But then a series of stray cats worked their way into his soft heart. Wally, a scruffy gray furball, Oscar, the tabby, and Gray Puss, the gentle gray Persian that first moved into a nest of blankets Dad had set up on the playhouse porch. Problem was allergies, but Dad built elaborate cat residences in the Belgravia garage and at the lake in later years. These strays, like hobos, found a friendly home for life. Today, all three kids love cats, and the good news is the generation of grandchildren have outgrown the allergies and have very special rescue kittens in their lives. You have all experienced how Sonia so loved her Dito through the beautiful artwork she created for today's program. Evan and Claire spent most of their lives thousands of miles away from their Dito but their souls were always connected. They never missed an opportunity to visit him, and in Casey's last days, they were both there at his bedside with all of us. As the kids and grandkids gathered in Edmonton each year, Mom organized an evening for all of us in the historic River Valley Walterdale homes for the McDade's Candlelight Christmas. Dad loved it, especially when drummer boy Dan was invited to join in. Dad loved music, and the McDades captured it all. Forever proud of his jazz drumming son, Dad always made the effort to catch Dan's gigs. He enjoyed them immensely. So, you are about to be listening to Dan Skaken on the drums. George Kufrigenakis on the guitar, Mark Baudin on the contrabass, and we're going to play a George Shearing composition called Lullaby in Birdland, and this one's for my dad. One, two, oh, one, two, three. <laughs>
As Dennis Wozny described, Casey had a crazy ability to sketch, even upside down, probably to scale, a three-dimension solution to what you might be discussing. Complicated construction details could be solved in a coffee shop on a napkin, only to be left for the server to throw away. He worked closely with Sandy in support of her career in pottery and took great pride in her ceramics. They worked together to produce the precious bells that are enjoyed in so many homes on Christmas trees each year. He even ventured into working with Clay himself, demonstrating a natural talent for raku work when he and Sandy took classes together. Jack-o'-lanterns were front and center every Halloween. Casey went to great lengths to wrap his gifts. Each of these had our names carefully cut out and glued to the wrapping paper. He also made a huge effort to make sure that Sandy couldn't guess what her presents were. One Christmas, he suspended a delicate gold bracelet from the corners of a very large box. It was huge and felt empty. It was great sport keeping her guessing. In 1969, Sandy and Casey signed up their girls for Saturday morning art classes that were held in the lower level of the Edmonton Art Gallery. They were taught how to make block prints by carving an image on a piece of battleship linoleum. From that year onward, Casey worked with his kids to create the annual family Christmas card. The first card of ice skaters told the story of another family tradition. Every year, first thing on Christmas morning, Casey bundled up the family to go ice skating, but often it snowed overnight and Casey had to clear the ice. Dad loved to deck the trees with Christmas lights. And the red fireball on the Japanese maple tree became his signature. The tradition continued in Wappelman. 
and continues to shine as Dan, Sonia, and Elizabeth have kept the fireball glowing each Christmas in front of their home in Park Allen in Edmonton. Casey loved photography. We treasured seeing the world through his eyes in the early years of slide carousels and over the decades through volumes of carefully constructed photo albums and certainly in much of what we've shared here today. In the latter years, with the onset of Alzheimer's, with a digital camera in hand, he shared the joy in his heart, capturing the beautiful details of the world around him when he could no longer express himself with words. I was particularly enthusiastic as I described to Dad this incredible construction site that I had walked in Winnipeg the prior week. Massive concrete walls, inclined, curved, colored. It was like walking through a sculpture. I know, Nadine, I know. I think Dad got a bit frustrated trying to interrupt me. Words were getting more challenging but he knew exactly what I was talking about and then found a way to tell me that he and mom had been donating routinely over the past decade to the construction of the Museum of Human Rights that I was describing. So as we wrap that conversation up, dad told me he wanted to be there when it opened. So for the official opening in September of 2014, we flew to Winnipeg. Dad had his compact digital camera, but forgot the battery, or forgot to charge the battery, or who knows. Then he looked at me and said, Damn Alzheimer's. I put my Nikon Coolpix in his hands, and this is the gift he gave to us. We were exceptionally fortunate that after considerable delays, this bronze sculpture, contributed by the Ukraine, had arrived at the museum just two weeks prior. It was titled Breaking the Silence. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Dad was very happy that we were able to experience the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. Mom and Dad moved from Lake Wabaman into a lovely suite in Canterbury Manor and enjoyed their years there together immensely. Featured here on the Canterbury calendar for the month of June when they celebrated their wedding anniversary. Casey enjoyed having his sisters-in-law, Nettie and Bess, living in the same complex. In the Friday afternoon, happy hours were a lot of fun. Some days they even fixed him a martini. Canterbury welcomed all of us. Dad's birthday celebrations at Canterbury were always special. Of course, Mom always brought his cake but the staff catered and always made the gatherings a lot of fun. But Dad knew that they'd treated him extra special. Thank you. Sandy and Casey celebrated many wedding anniversaries, including their 65th this past year. Upon learning that Dad had passed away, Nancy Burden, a friend and their physiotherapist, wrote to Mom. In her words, If any couple deserved the moniker Two Peas in a Pod, it was you and Casey. Many couples operate best at a bit of arm's length from each other. 
needing some space. There are, however, those rare and precious marriages where the partners travel through the years as if still in the first dance of their married lives. Like two puzzle pieces neatly fitting together. I know that there will be a huge hole in your life with Casey's passing. The Casey I knew was just such a kind, gentle guy with a lovely soft chuckle. He was so understated for his many skills and accomplishments. I admit I worried for you two when you finally had to leave the Wobham Gardens behind to move to Canterbury, but I needn't have. You both couldn't help but connect to the new people around you. If Casey wasn't repairing something broken, you were restoring the flower beds on the property. You both seem to have done that throughout your lives, generously nurturing and giving to people around you. We know that Casey will be right by your side, if only in spirit. You two were inseparable in life, like branches of an intertwined vine, and I believe will remain so now, just in an altered state. Thank you, Nancy, for writing this so well. Thanks for sharing this day of celebration with us, because Casey was our friend. and he will always be our dad. He will always be our Dito. And he is an eternal soulmate. Those are remarkable memories. Um, that you've captured there, and uh, I'm sure that those in themselves will be passed through the generations, and um, those stories and the essence of Casey will be remembered. Amazing Grace is a much-loved and popular hymn of faith and reassurance, and family friends Diana Cohen and Roman Rabinovich have traveled here from Calgary, and they're going to um, play this for us today.
Let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. We give you thanks for Casey, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for the ways he blessed the world in his 88 years, for the love he gave and received while he was with us, and for all that was good in his life and for the memories we now treasure. Lord, remembering Casey today has been blessing to us, and yet we still grieve those we love and see no more. Surround Casey's family with your love. Bring them comfort in their loss and strength for each day. Be with them in hope as they continue in this new time. Gracious God, you promised eternal life to those who believe. Bring all who rest in Christ into the fullness of your kingdom, where sins have been forgiven and death is no more. We look for the fullness of the resurrection when Christ shall gather all his saints to reign with him in glory forever. Amen. Jesus' disciples once asked him how they should pray, and Jesus gave them an example we now call the Lord's Prayer, and I invite those of you who wish to join me as we pray those words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen scripture teaches us that god's mercy and love turns the darkness of death into the dawn of new life and we trust in these promises as we now entrust Casey to the arms of God's mercy. Let us pray what we call the commendation. Into your hands, O Lord, we humbly commend Casey Anatoly Skaken. In this life, you embraced him with your love and opened to him the gate of heaven. The old order has passed away as you welcome him into paradise where there will be no sorrow, no weeping, nor pain, but the everlasting fullness of peace and joy with your Son. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may God give each of you his comfort and his peace and the light and joy of his presence as you go today. Amen. Following our service today, uh, Sandy, Nadine, Dan, and Andrea and their families invite you to join them in some fellowship and refreshments, and the staff will guide you there as you leave. Um, and also for Canterbury residents, there is refreshments in the activity room. As we close our service, we'll hear again from um, Diana Cohen and on violin and Roman Rabinovich on keyboard and thank you very much for your talents and gifts to us today. <laughs> 